Chapter 16, Renewable Energy. This book in many ways is about wise management of resources in relation to one's particular bioregion and site conditions. There is also an emphasis on the capture, retention, recycling, upcycling, and reuse of all resources. In the case of energy, all these things apply, but there's an additional layer to consider our urgent need to stop using fossil fuels and shrink our energy consumption for the sake of all life on Earth. If we go back in time, we can see that for most of human history, we have actually been working on different ways to harness the sun's energy stored in the wood we charred, in the fossil fuels we burned, in plants we grew, in the foods we ate, and in innumerable other ways. Fossil fuels, too, are ancient sources of captured solar energy that formed from ancient deposits of decomposed matter. The last 50 to 60 years have seen the greatest acceleration of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere, and this period coincides with the rise of consumerism in the late 1950s. Fashion and fad, rather than need, drove demand, and these consumer avenues were driven by novelties such as television programming and omnipresent advertising. These fashions and fads, not based on natural needs or patterns, have in turn generated abnormal and unnatural behaviors individually and collectively. Examples of these abnormalities might be the cult of the tidy lawn and the tidy garden to garnish the homes of the American dream, which in the Western Hemisphere went on to drive consumption of fuel-powered lawnmowers and toxic herbicides, then tractor-like mowers, and finally to eutrophication and topsoil loss and contamination. The constant removal of biomass to the detriment of our soils, leading to the battery-operated plastic leaf blowers of today, the bags of leaves on the curb, seasonal burning, and the seasonal bare fields of the Midwest. Companies also taught us to believe that it is old-fashioned to use hand tools, to repair things ourselves, to grow food ourselves, and to be self-reliant because they wanted to sell us modern electrified tools, homes, and lifestyles. Automation and leisure became the focus. The list of old-fashioned equipment replaced by systems designed to be costly and to cost electricity is endless. Science became servant to consumerism as planned obsolescence took over, and we lost the thread of connection between our needs and what a natural response to our needs was. We need to draw a veil over this phase of our history and enter a new phase. In this chapter, we discuss some of the many technologies, ancient, current, and upcoming, that pair up with natural cycles without drawing down on fossil fuel originated power. Every bioregion will have a different set of possibilities. Some areas are dominated by the sun year-round, while other areas are dominated by forests and long, dark winters. Some areas have constant rain and others seasonal floods. It is our job as designers and responsible earth dwellers to observe and interact ethically with what our bioregion has to offer. Human power. Used longer than any other technology, humans have used hand tools and their bodies to work with animals, plants, and the soil since before we had written or oral historical records. Hand tools can be extraordinarily powerful and effective. Teams of hundreds and thousands of strong men and women with shovels can install rainwater catchment in city landscapes across the world within a few months' time. Many machines can be replaced with smart designs that increase yields and are dependent on human power. If everyone gardened locally with hand tools, we would save the energy and resources spent producing, packaging, and shipping the food, as well as the energy spent earning money to buy the food. If we cut back the vegetation with scythes instead of gas-powered mowers and weed whackers, we would avoid fossil fuel consumption and improve our health as we work outdoors. The jobs market and the energy market could both use more human power. It will proliferate local jobs as it saves energy and money for people locally. Money that would be leaving the community would instead remain within that community and enrich it. Bioregionality. The alternative energy systems used on any given site are determined by what is available in that bioregion and ideally on site. Usually this means a collection of different energy systems are used seasonally with varying yields. Having multiple ways to store and generate power is always wise, as is having a backup system. 
Potential sources of energy can be consistent strong winds, water pressure, moving waters, falling water, solar radiation, fish oil, or even woody biomass. The possibilities are limitless. Anywhere solar energy is captured, it can be stored and released. Wind and water move in predictable patterns and are affected by the sun, trees, earthworks, and the greater terrain. All can be manipulated to focus their effect. We can speed water up, slow it down, increase its pressure, etc. These raw elements and effects of nature give us resources that never run out, though often they are either always running or seasonally affected. We have to recognize what energies we can capture where we are currently or orient ourselves to where those energies are. The tropics bask in persistent vertical sunlight and therefore experience high evaporation. The amount of biological cycling tends to make large dams economically unfeasible over the long term. The best source of energy in this region is the sun since it is constant and powering the rapid pace of all other cycles. Microhydraulic power, small wind systems, and many other methods can all work depending on what is available. In hot arid regions like the Sahara, large solar farms are currently starting up. In the cold temperate climates where each year there is significant seasonal growth, stick fires for clean heat and energy may be the best option, especially in areas where the sun is too dim in the winters for greenhouses to be effective at warming a home or growing food. In these areas, rocket mass heaters can provide heat and help grow foods not dependent on winter sunlight. As we explore these options, feel free to combine and tinker with them since they are all based on simple principles that can be applied to almost any site or system. The Energy Audit or EROEI We must always consider the Complete Energy Audit or EROEI, Energy Returned Over Energy Invested. A sustainable EROEI would be one-to-one -one ratio, but a regenerative and profitable EROEI would be more energy return than invested. If we do not count all inputs of energy, time, and resources, we cannot know the actual energy it takes to get the desired output and whether the process is worthwhile at all. Ethanol is the classic example. It takes more energy to grow and process corn into a gallon of ethanol than is contained in a gallon of ethanol. While corn biomass can make a good fuel in a number of ways, the way we are doing it is energy intensive. Quote, overlay the EROEI with your biome climate and context and the choices become clear on what will work and what won't. End quote. Troy Martz, Alternative Energy Expert, 2016. Making things that last. Planned obsolescence is a design principle unique to the age of industrialism. It's the idea that you sell things that are designed to break, wear out, or become obsolete within a short period of time to guarantee continued company sales. This can be seen throughout consumer culture today, as is the case of constantly updated iPhones. This all came about because of the indestructible suitcase that was actually indestructible. That's how it was advertised and sold. The company very quickly realized they were going to put themselves out of business once everyone had purchased their new suitcase. So they changed the design so the handle unraveled after a few years. The idea being the suitcase was still indestructible, but the handle was not. This trend has led to lower quality consumer products and incredible amounts of waste. Luckily, we can make things that last generations and in the end ideally compost or at least recycle them. The following sections have several examples of long-lasting technologies, even generational ones. The Edison Iron Nickel Battery Thomas Edison's Iron Nickel Battery, invented in 1901, can last 25 years or more. Some batteries have even lasted generations. This technology was bought out in 1975 by Exide, the world's second largest manufacturer of lead acid batteries, and then taken off the market. Though cheap to buy, lead acid batteries need maintenance and only last 7 to 10 years. Luckily, iron nickel batteries are making a comeback as one of the best solutions to off-grid solar and wind energy storage along with increasingly popular Li Ion batteries. These batteries slowly take in and slowly release energy. They are DC or deep cycle batteries that are ideal for solar and wind power storage since they generate energy in trickles. Iron nickel batteries do need regular additions of water, but with a clear container, it is easier to monitor. These batteries can also take great abuse. 
pay for themselves over time and improve over time. Companies like Iron Edison are currently selling these batteries as well as sealed lithium iron batteries which are projected to last even longer with no maintenance needed similar to the now popular Li Ion batteries which come with up to 20 year warranties. Lights that last. There was a time when light bulb filaments were made by hand and because of this they varied in quality with some lasting decades. The Livermore Centennial Light Bulb of Fire Station 6 of Livermore, California has been shining for over 114 years, over a million hours. The light bulb's filament operates at a very low wattage, is complex, and has been continuously on, all of which contribute to its longevity. We can develop products that last, but we have to revive craftsmanship by shifting our support from industrial manufactured products to locally produced ones, or we have to produce these products ourselves. We also have to use less energy in general, just like the light bulb, to last longer. This may mean that we rely upon LEDs, bioluminescence, or candlelight at night instead of standard light bulbs. We either need lights that last or are worth the energy spent in their creation like LEDs, or ideally we need to use compostable regenerative solutions that we can source locally. Passive Systems Passively powered systems have infinite potential, but rely upon certain conditions. Whether it's the heat or light from the sun, the behavior of hot, cool, dry, or moist air, or the pressure or cooling temperature of water, we can harness the power of nature in a system that creates reliable and even constant energy. Passive systems work without or with minimal maintenance and are usually always on in a constantly running system. An example of this would be a water mill's wheel turning with the flow of water. Trying to stop it could very well destroy it. A rainwater catchment cistern uphill from the home can provide water for the home that is pressurized, held, and accumulated passively. Passive solar heating. We can heat all our homes using the sun even in the dead of winter. We can insulate our homes well with something natural like straw bales, earth, or cob. We can use windows facing the sun path to let the sunlight in to heat the home. The direction depends on your hemisphere. Greenhouses or even just thermosiphons designed to make hot air can be used as well. Heat rises, so any way that a designer can sink heat below the home allows this heat to slowly rise and warm everything through conduction and then through radiation as the objects in the home release that heat. This can be done with solar collectors that heat up rods that connect to the metal running below or inside the foundation or it can be done by having a concrete pad that connects the greenhouse to the house. There is limitless room for innovation in passive solar heating. Passive cooling. Using air from a well, creating microclimates, timing watering for evaporative cooling, which can be done passively, and cooling air by pulling it through the earth are all feasible options for creating passive cooling. In tropical areas or in many work areas, encouraging the movement of air is critical. Homes can be designed to pull in cool air and to release hot air as well since hot air rises and cool air falls. Solar ovens. Using the same principle as a greenhouse that isn't ventilated on a hot day, food can be cooked efficiently with solar energy. Durable metal and glass solar ovens are commercially available, though they can be built out of cardboard, a casserole dish, and a piece of glass and still be effective. Additional mirrors or reflectors can be added to increase the solar energy focused on the food. Similar in concept, food that is brought up to a high temperature can be insulated and sealed in a container to keep the heat bottled up and continue the cooking process. Using the sun to cook food keeps the heat out of our homes and in the hot, arid regions. This is a win-win situation. Hydraulic ram or ram pump. Using the constant flow of water in a ram pump, we can pump that water to a higher elevation or magnify the pressure of that water without using any extra energy aside from the kinetic energy of the initial flow. The hammer effect creates pressure that develops as the flow is bottlenecked and then forced out a different way. This greatly magnifies the pressure and increases the PSI, pounds per square inch, of the water in that hose or irrigation system as well. For a full energy audit, the mining, refining, and creation of the ram pump would be included, so it is critical that a long-lasting ram pump be used or built. Water wheels. 
These can be used in a series of different ways, but the water wheels turn with the power of water and use that passively created energy to do a variety of tasks. Compressing air, harvesting fish, grinding grain, running a sawmill, generating electricity, pumping water, and many more creative applications. Wheel pump. Water can also be pushed up a hose or across a landscape using the kinetic energy of it passing to turn a wheel. Some wheels power a pump, and in some cases the wheel is itself the pump. The pressure created can easily take water uphill or into a containment area with an overspill that rejoins the flow of water. The continuous flow creates passive energy that can be used in a variety of applications. The Barsha water pump or rain pump uses those principles and is currently being trialed and tested. It works continuously with the flow of water, constantly taking in more water as it turns, and the pressure of the current magnifies inside the wheel and sends the water up the hose. The Pelton Wheel Considered the most efficient water wheel ever devised, the Pelton Wheel has a concave split bucket design that prevents backspray and absorbs the water's force efficiently. The largest one ever used was at the North Star Mine and Power Generation Facility in California to provide compressed air for a now closed gold mine. With 77% efficiency, the Pelton Wheel is much more efficient than current modern electricity generation methods like coal and nuclear power, and that is why it is still used today in hydroelectric generation. Pelton wheel systems rely upon water and create numerous outputs, geysers, compressed air, electricity, hot water, and water pressure. When the 18-foot wide Pelton wheel referred to the picture was in operation, it would get up to 70 miles per hour and was driven by two jets of water pressurized by 700 feet, 213 meter drop in elevation. The nearby town could redesign and restore this Pelton wheel power generation plant and start creating energy for the town passively and locally. Bioluminescent algae and fungi lighting. Many plants and animals express bioluminescence, algae and fungi being the most adaptable and malleable examples. Lamps of glowing green algae thick water are being developed to reduce atmospheric carbon levels. Easy to maintain, these oxygen releasing algae lamps can give us night lamps that are powered by the sun and atmospheric CO2. Bioluminescent fungi, both mycelium and the mushroom fruit, also exist and mycologists are currently working on developing a way to source them in cities and homes as well. Making things that compost. Almost everything we use needs to be compostable, be renewable, or easily and safely recyclable. Making things that compost is the ideal. If our clothing turns into mulch that can be composted with our kitchen scraps, we will prevent an immense amount of ecological destruction and contamination on top of saving energy. If the fiber for our clothes can be grown and raised in the backyard or in the back field, the amount of energy saved will be even greater. From the shed, to the hand tool, to the garbage can, to the shopping bag, all these choices can be regenerative. Fewest moving parts principle. As with the Barsha pump, the Ram pump, and the rocket mass heater, having few or preferably no moving parts in a system is critical to longevity, to the overall energy audit, and to smooth functioning. As with the principle of the least change for maximum effect, the few as possible moving parts principle in an engine or energy capturing system helps maintain the system, reduces work, and keeps things simple.